Hello, this podcast is slightly different to others that we've done before. Our guest has wrote two books. One of them is called The 80-20 Principle, and it's a book that's been around for years, and one that has really, out of all the books I've read, really, really impacted me. And it's something that I continue to work on and try and understand how I can fit those principles into my life and my business. So when I heard that this guy had got a new book, which is called Unreasonable Success, I was very interested to try and get hold of him and do an interview. Outside of his books, you can't really find too much about him online outside of an interview he did about 12 months ago with Tim Ferriss, which I'd highly recommend you checking out. The reason it wasn't easy to do this interview is this guy is pretty busy. He has homes around the world and um, he's in South Africa and Portugal and Spain. So trying to set up an interview with him was extremely difficult. We did the first interview about nine months ago and when I was preparing I had pages and pages of questions. The depth of the answers that this gentleman goes into burns through quite a lot of time. So the, th the 30 minutes that I was given to speak to him just disappeared extremely quickly. So I was quite disappointed that I felt I had half of an interview without really going into a lot of depth. After some time, the team had managed to get this gentleman to agree to do another 30 minutes, which we did today. And we was able to answer a lot of, or quite a few of the remaining questions I had for this gentleman. So whilst I could have done with at least two hours with him, and I'd recommend that you do check him out and check out his books. So we had to splice the two interviews together at about 30 minutes. So you will notice a little bit of a transition at that point in the middle of the interview, but the content was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure that you will enjoy this interview with Mr. Richard Koch, the author of The 80-20 Principle and Unreasonable Success. Please enjoy this interview. Well, well look, Richard, thank you. Thank you so much for taking um, the time to speak with us today. I, I thoroughly enjoyed your book. I've read it several times. And um, what I'd like to start for people that haven't read it is, um, is, why, is um, why is unlocking the nine secrets of people that change the world? Why is the concept or philosophy that you've written about, why is this a credible philosophy? I really have always been fascinated by success and what causes success. And one of the things that's always struck me, Matthew, is that the people who are very successful in changing the world, whether it's for good or bad uh, or, or neutral morally, um, they do tend to be rather surprising often. They do tend to be people who um, have had often a lot of failures in their career. And then suddenly they do something which really makes a huge difference to them, but more particularly to, to the rest of the world. And I was trying to figure out why. And um, I was driven into this by uh, actually trying to deal with um, the question of what is it that causes success? Is it possible to reduce it to some kind of formula? Because uh, I don't think anyone's really manage to explain why it is that some people are very successful and often their peers the people who um if you like are competing with them or colleagues with them um at the same level fall away that they're not very successful often people who appear to be much more competent who appear to be much more conscientious who appear to work harder they're often not the people who really make a huge difference in the world and you get oddball characters, characters like Jeff Bezos, for example, uh, Nelson Mandela, Margaret Thatcher, um, even someone like uh, uh, Albert Einstein, who is generally credited with genius, but actually in the beginning of his career was not terribly successful and was not very good at mathematics. It's, it's, a, it's a curious thing why some people make a huge difference. And so what I did was to try and look at all the possible causes of success. And I took 20 people that I knew had been, by universal consent, very effective in having a major impact on the world. Whether, as I say, whether it was necessarily a very good impact or whether it was a controversial impact or whether it's an impact, uh, as was perhaps Vladimir Lenin, 
and also one of the people who I wanted to have in my book, but my publishers wouldn't let me have it, which was Adolf Hitler. Uh, and, uh, you know, people who are universally, not universally, but generally credited with doing some terrible, terrible, what well, they did, some terrible, terrible things. They killed millions and millions of people. I shouldn't joke about it. I mean, it's absolutely terrible. But nevertheless, they were, they were effective. And they were effective from nowhere. I mean, uh, uh, Hitler's actually a rather good example, as I haven't talked about Hitler, so let me give you an exclusive on Hitler. <laughs> During the first 25 years of his life, he was a total and utter failure at every level. He couldn't maintain any friendships. He was socially isolated. Uh, he ran through some money which he'd got from his father. Uh, he, he never held down a decent job. No one had a good word to say about him, and quite right too. You know, he was a total non-entity. And how was it, therefore, that after the, the first 25 years of his life, he became someone who, you know, obviously was a, a horrible, evil person, but nevertheless, he became amazingly effective. And that was kind of like the question that I was trying to answer. Why, why is it that it works very well for some people and not for other people? Despite the fact that, you know, Hitler had a very poor intellect, uh, he uh, was very lazy, uh, uh, he couldn't maintain friendships because he was a, you know, really horrible human being, and, uh, and, and he had lots and lots of setbacks. Why is it that actually uh, for, you know, not for forever, not for the thousand years that, of the Reich that he hoped for, but why was it that for... Uh, between about 1933 and 1944, just over a decade, why was it that he became a master of Europe? Yeah, how, how could that be? That effectively he he knocked France out of uh, out of the war very quickly. He he wasn't able to invade the United Kingdom, but he was able to keep England isolated, etc. Uh, the Russians who got millions and millions and millions of people that they were willing to throw at the war effort you know, basically went on the retreat and almost got knocked out of the war at Stalingrad. Why was it that this man, who had no military experience either, you know, why was it that he was able to be super, super successful? And what did he have in common with the other 19 people in the book? So Winston Churchill was in the book, Marie Curie, uh, the, the inventor of radium was in the book. Um, even uh, Madonna is in the book for my sins, and some other people that I've known in business, as also uh, Jeff Bezos is, is in there. So what, do these people have anything in common? That was really what I was trying to get at. And I, I took 50 possible reasons why people might be successful. I've been suggested by people like Malcolm Gladwell or by other writers or by uh, commentators or just people that I knew and from my own experience people say well so and so was very successful because of this that and the other well this that and the other went on my list of 50 things and I tried to find the common denominator between these um, people my 20 people who without question impacted the world in a really major way and the um, and the, the reasons, the explanations for success. And I went through it, and there were just nine that actually stood up to the test of being universally present in all of these 20 cases. And these nine things are described as what I, I call them landmarks in the book, and I have a map, you know, it's mm -hmm. quite a nice way of presenting it, and say that, you know, if you want to be very successful, uh, you really ought to grasp these these nine points some of them are attitudes and not exactly personality traits but the way in which people behave for example thriving on setbacks is one of the very important things that the, the people who were very successful often had more setbacks than successes but the one or two successes that they had just made all the difference of course the successes came after the setbacks and the question is, you know, if they, had, if they had given up, then perhaps they wouldn't be there. But nevertheless, having setbacks appears to be a really good thing. Uh, if, you, if you can actually cope with the fact that you're going through a really rough time. Uh, so, you know, some of them are attitudes and others are what I call strategies or experiences. And one example of that is 
transforming experiences. And I'll come back to both Mr. Bezos and Mr. Hitler in talking about this. I discovered that all of these people, every single one of them, had had a, a, an experience which changed them from, in the case of Hitler, for example, a total non-entity, to someone who was very powerful and effective. And uh, these transforming experiences really made all the difference. If these people had not had the transforming experience, and sometimes it lasted for a decade, sometimes it lasted, well, in the case of J.K. Rowling, uh, her transforming experience was a vision on the train of, of Harry Potter, and that lasted for a, about four hours while the train between Manchester and London was was broken down. Uh, in other cases, Adolf Hitler, uh, it was the First World War which initially made the difference to him because he found a role that he could fit into. He never got promoted to colonel. He was always a, a, a corporal, rather. He was always a private, at the lowest rank in the army. But nevertheless, he was respected. He was a good soldier. He was very brave. And he found self-respect. And he also found an ideology which was very German nationalist and, and obviously uh, incredibly anti-Semitic and, and incredibly opposed to anyone that wasn't, that stood in the way of the success of greater Germany. Um, but the really crucial thing for Adolf Hitler was in the, after the war, he got demobbed and therefore he became nobody once more, a big zero. And then suddenly there was a social revolution in 1919 in um, Munich, in Bavaria. And uh, the federal government in Germany decided that they had to crush this revolution. It was a, it was a revolution which uh, was largely led by soldiers uh, who were communists, the Reds. And, and uh, so the powers in Germany had to use the rest of the army to absolutely ruthlessly put down this social revolution in Germany. And one of the things that they did, once they basically killed most of the ringleaders here, was realize that the ordinary soldiers needed brainwashing, I suppose. They needed to understand what they were supposed to do. They needed to have the right attitudes. And the right attitudes were you know, pretty nasty. They were, you know, they were grounded in the idea that there was something inherently superior about Germans. They were grounded in the idea that, you know, Jews were a threat to civilization. And they were also grounded in the idea that, that communism was a terrible, terrible cancer. Uh, but what they did in the army was recruited a group of 25, about 25, uh, propagandists, I suppose they were. These were people that they thought could give speeches and they would wheel them out to one group of soldiers one day and another group of soldiers another day and so on and so forth. They sent these people to university uh, for a, a few weeks and they were basically themselves brainwashed by the most virulent and persuasive uh, far-right uh, national socialists, basically, professors. And then they, they then deployed them uh, in talking to the troops, and they would go and rant and rave, particularly in the case of Hitler. And he discovered that he was rather good at ranting and raving, that people actually thought this guy is incredibly sincere, incredibly powerful, and a fantastic orator. And that discovery, which took about six months, utterly transformed Adolf Hitler. In other words, as with all these people, he went into the experience as one person and he came out of the experience as a totally different sort of person. A powerful person, a person who could persuade people, a person who really believed in something and communicated that with unbelievable force and even eloquence. I mean, ranting and raving, yes, but nevertheless, very, very uh, powerful. And so that totally transformed this guy who, in the, even in the First World War, had not been able to make any impact and had been passed over, you know, for any promotion 
on the grounds that he didn't have what the Germans called leadership qualities, which is Führer something or other, which is highly ironic as uh, Hitler became or decided that to appoint himself as the Führer, the leader. Uh, so <clears throat> it was it was just totally contradictory. And, uh, you know, just, just one other example, Jeff Bezos um, was a very unsuccessful 25-year-old uh, investment banker. He hated being an investment banker banker on Wall Street. He absolutely despised the um, people, in, you know, with great suits and, you know, red braces and so on and so forth, and who um, only really wanted to make money. And uh, a headhunter, he said to the headhunter, find me another job. I don't want to be in investment banking anymore. And the headhunter said, well, I, I, yeah, maybe, but I want to send you to the most untypical, atypical uh, investment bank, which there, there is on Wall Street. And he sent him to a company called D.E. Shaw and Company, run by a former computer professor called David Shaw, David E. Shaw. Um, and this was a totally different kind of company. It was one which decided that they would create a different kind of hedge fund. And the hedge fund would be based around concepts and analysis and quantitative analysis of a very, very high quality. And they made the discovery, or came to the opinion anyway, that the internet was going to be a fantastically powerful method of retailing. And that was back in 1992. That was before, you know, um, almost all the Wall Street banks even had URLs or any website or anything like that. But uh, David Shaw was passionate about the idea that the internet was going to, to explode, was going to be fantastically effective in selling product. And he appointed Jeff Bezos as his project manager on a project to try and create a company which would do that. And of course, that became Amazon. All of the ideas which originated from Amazon, the idea of very high customer service, the idea of selling a huge range of product eventually, but starting with one particular category of books, you know, that that would somehow be unbelievably successful and would grow and grow and grow and eventually end up comprising probably the largest company in retailing in the world. It would replace Walmart. It would replace any of the, the, the people based on pr bricks and mortar. And this was a time when the conventional wisdom, as you may remember in the early 1990s, was, well, the internet's a wonderful thing, but it's all countercultural. It's all, you know, people giving their opinions. It's all very uncommercial and, and will never, ever be a way to make a lot of money. Um, and that was true in many respects. I mean, the dot-com crash of 1999 was a function of the fact that most of the companies which were huge stars for a very short period of time actually could never make any money. They didn't have a business model which would provide that. But Bezos did have one, and he got it from David Shaw, and the two of them worked together on that. They worked out that books should be the first category. And David Shaw wanted Bezos to lead that company, but within D.E. Shaw and Company, and Bezos said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do it on my own. And very, very surprisingly, after they walked in Central Park for a couple of hours, uh, David Shaw said to Jeff, I'm not persuading you, go and do it, go and do it yourself. And of course, we, we know what happened subsequently. Um, and Bezos at one stage just lost the title. But anyway, it's the richest person in the world. We probably don't need to feel too sorry for him. He's got more, more than a bob or two. So uh, it, it was a totally transforming experience. And so one of the things for people who want to be very successful is to consider perhaps you should engineer your transforming experience. And in the book, as I think you have probably read, Matthew, I, I suggest ways of doing it. And one, one of the best ways is to identify either a trend in, in business or a company or a social movement and so forth, which is very small at the moment, but could be absolutely massive and is very high growth. And that's what I based the whole of my investment policy on is finding businesses which could be the leader in a new segment of the market which currently doesn't exist or is very small like the betting exchange thing where I invested in 2000 in a company called Betfair which was 
which was absolutely tiny, and nobody else would invest in that. No professional investor, and I'm not a professional investor, I'm an amateur, but no professional investor, no venture capital company, no private equity company would invest in this company. And why? They wouldn't invest in it because it was run by 20 year olds who never had a proper job in their life. <laughs> they, were, they were either gambling enthusiasts yes. or sports enthusiasts, but they had no experience of running a company. And so, of course, professional man, money managers, even those in venture capital, you know, just wouldn't consider funding this particular company. But what attracted it to me was that although it was very, very small, it was growing at sometimes 30, 40 or 50 percent, not a year, but a month. <laughs> so the numbers were, were tiny, but they were growing unbelievably fast. And I said, well, you know, if you extrapolated that for three or four years, you'd have a really attractive and very profitable business. So I took Richard. a 10% stake in that company for very little money. Yeah. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. Richard, so, um, do, do, do you think there's, um, I I'm, I'm, I'm sort of was uh, turned on to you originally with your initial book, The 80-20 Principle, and and do, do you think there's any overlap with, with um, like you mentioned about Hitler and his, his, you know, his amazing talent as an orator and be able to influence people, and then, you know, Jeff Bezos and how they originally started with, with just books. Do, do you see there's a, a connection between those two books in anywhere or an overlap between those sort of two philosophies at all? Yes, I mean the the, the uh, not not many people have spotted that. In fact, you may be the person, Matthew, to say that most clearly. So I I think that's absolutely true. And in fact, maybe it didn't strike me at first. The ho the, the whole point about eighty twenty was that it was re reductionism. It was saying you know the twenty percent will generate twenty percent of sales, will generate eighty percent of profits, or whatever the the relationship is, and that if you take this principle, you can spot it everywhere. You know, 80-20 is absolutely everywhere. And nobody looks at it. And, you know, in, in the 80-20 principle, I talk about, you know, very mundane things like your clothes, you know. Now, this jumper here <laughs> is only one of about five jumpers I ever wear. You know, I've got, I've got a closet full of them. I've got, you know, masses of jumpers. But, you know, we tend to wear the same clothes over and over again. Uh, because we like them or because in my case <laughs> I'm quite, quite lazy and I just throw it, throw it and wear it the next day. But nevertheless, um, that's a very powerful thing. And there is always a reason which is much more powerful than anything else. And that is the link to unreasonable success. I was trying to find a reduction of, you know, why is it that some people are very successful and other people who perhaps deserve success more are not successful. And this is this is why I ended up with my nine landmarks. So yes, I think that is that's a very good point. And it's relevant in sport, it's relevant in all the things that you're engaged in. It's, you know, there's always one reason which accounts for an awful lot of success in any particular very narrow area. And all you've got to do is to identify what that is. Uh, my book on success is, is much more general, and that is actually saying, is there something which is almost universally true, or perhaps even universally true? Um, and uh, if you take those things seriously, then you, you doesn't guarantee that you're going to be what I call unreasonably successful, which is more successful than you really deserve, uh, or what the other people would predict for you. And the un and the example I gave of transforming experience is one of the nine things, which I think is probably, there are three or four things in the book which are really original, and the rest is just saying, well, everyone before has talked about setbacks being important. Are they universally important? And I, I think I've demonstrated that they, they are. Well, um, so some of those things are, are not so original, but they're still very, very important. Yeah. Um, and 
Yeah, and I'm just trying to say, let's reduce it to a formula. Is it possible? And, mm. you know, for transforming experiences, the people who had these transforming experiences didn't actually plan them. But I'm saying, well, perhaps we can. If you realize yeah. that you've got to have a transforming experience to be very successful and you haven't had one, well, let's think about where you could get one from. And that, that's what one of the things in the book which I think is most helpful. Yeah, and I like at the end you actually explain how you could potentially um, orchestrate those transformation experiences, which, which I'd recommend anyone who reads the book. Um, what, what, one of the questions I had is, uh, you know, which, which, which was quite refreshing to me, is you talk about it's not about ability, but it's about attitude and strategies. Um, and you mentioned the fact that, you know, ability gives you small returns and, and puts you in, in a business perspective, puts you in front of a lot of competition, whereas attitude gives you huge returns and, and, and puts you in front of a, a very few com, com, uh, competitors. What, what's in, in terms of being able to um, develop attitude and strategies, is, is this something which is like an inborn talent or are these skills that you think you can actually develop over time through practice? Well, let's take one of the ones which is a very good example of what you've just been talking about, Matthew, uh, which is self-belief. OK, now, the reason that most people do not acquire fantastic or unreasonable success is because they don't try. Their aspirations are not sky high. And in order to have very high aspirations, you have to believe in yourself very strongly. Not, not to be arrogant or unpleasant, you know, but, but to believe that you've got something or come across something. It might not be an attribute of yours. It might be uh, a product. It might be a way of doing things or whatever, which is very, very powerful. And that generates self-belief. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it's true that there are some people in the world who innately are self-believers. I think if you look at the people who actually do come to acquire a very high degree of self-confidence, sometimes they're very modest people who start off uh, very modestly. I mean, Albert Einstein, believe it or not, was in that category. Uh, he, he's, as you know, probably started off as a, a patent clerk, grade three in, in the uh, patent office in Switzerland. And... Um, he was just incredibly curious about the new ideas in quantum mechanics, which had started about 1900 or something like that, a little bit before. But, you know, he basically read everything which was about, uh, you know, to do with quantum mechanics and started thinking about things like, you know, was time relative and, and all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, this was a guy who couldn't get into the best school in Zurich, who ended up in the Zurich Polytechnic, which was, you know, not particularly brilliant. It's a bit like, I better not say Birmingham politics. Because <laughs> people from from Birmingham and England won't like me anymore. But but you know, not a particularly great institution. He came almost bottom of his class. Uh, he couldn't add up, which is one thing which I can't do. So that's, I feel a lot of sympathy for that. And this was a guy who made discoveries in physics that nobody else could make. You know, I mean. It, it, it's sort of very puzzling. But one of the things about Albert Einstein is because he managed to crack the well, some of the problems, the problem of relativity in particular, that none of the experts had actually managed to crack. That gave him an enormous amount of self-confidence. And he, he had this strange belief, which I suppose some people have, um, which is that God was sort of, you know, he wasn't sort of, you know, a conventional Christian or anything like that, but he did believe in God. He believed in a sort of scientific God who was planting clues all over <laughs> nature and in the universe, which if you put them all together, you'd get the answer. So God was sort of like a big tease, really. So, I mean, but he really, I mean, you know, his beliefs were much more coherent and more profound than I've just expressed them uh, somewhat <laughs> facetiously. But nevertheless, you know, he did believe that you could find out things uh, if you just looked at the evidence from you know different points of view. He was never anybody who was a scientist who gathered data. He never collected data. He he just did thought experiments. He just sat there thinking very hard and using the ideas that other people had come up with and putting them together in a strange mix and 
solving a problem that no one else had solved. No, no experimental data. You know, other people later proved that he was right, but but you know, he never he never sort of solid his hands with data because he wasn't he wasn't very good at analysis. Something else that I can identify with. So you know, everyone says, "Oh, Albert Einstein, he's a genius," and all the rest of it. He wasn't the genius. He actually had some strange strategies, which then generated self belief. So I don't believe that he was born terribly, you know, arrogant or or self confident. Uh, Marie Curie, you know, a uh, very obscure woman from Poland who couldn't go to university because it was run by the Russians and the Russians wouldn't let people uh, go to university if they were women, you know, got very curious about certain chemical uh, assays and, and ideas uh, and um, eventually went to the Sorbonne in, in Paris and uh, you know, took a degree. She had she had almost no qualifications, but at that time they were letting people in if they were very highly motivated. They were letting women in, foreigners in, very different sort of attitude to most universities in the world. And she worked unbelievably hard, but she just basically studied radium, which, you know, she studied what became radium, a chemical that uh, uh, in the periodic table didn't exist at the time and so on and so forth. She, you know, she just basically got an idea about something which was very, very powerful. And she, you know, invented the concept really of radioactivity. And, you know, how could this be? She actually, in the Sorbonne, after she'd studied uh, chemistry, she came first in her class. I mean, how... How could that be? She hadn't had any of the educational advantages that other people had. She wasn't a very forceful personality. Uh, she was a woman, which was a huge disadvantage at the time, and so on and so forth. Well, but there, were, there are other reasons discussed in the book as to how she became very powerful. After her degree in chemistry, she did one in physics. She didn't come top. She only came second, but never mind. It was, it was, it was pretty good. As a combination and she actually worked on the boundary between physics and, and chemistry which no one else had really done so are these things innate i don't think so i think so, they are to some degree maybe some people are more self-confident than others definitely but you can generate self-confidence if you come up with an idea or a way of looking at things which is very powerful and that gives you self-confidence so belief in the project can become belief in the self and yeah. uh so, you know, when I'm you know, talking to people, I encourage them to try and find out something that no one else has uh, found out, that they are uniquely interested in. Yeah. And you, one of the things that people associate when they think of unreasonable success is hard work. And, and you, you mentioned um, someone who obviously was a mentor to you, which was Bill Bain. And one of the one of the comments I've read that you said is that he said, you know, action drives out thought and, and the importance of thought and, and also in, in relation to Bill Bain, the fact that he only used to work four hours, um, four hours a day or something like that. What, what's your views on, on hard work um, and, you know, sort of working 12, 14, 16 hours in relation to having unreasonable success? Well, I'm biased on this, Matthew, because I, I was very unsuccessful in my first serious job, which was at the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, because I wasn't any good at analysis, really. And as I said, I wasn't terribly good at, at uh, mathematics. <laughs> and uh, it was a very quantitative sort of approach that approach that they had, which was based on a very simple theory. But nevertheless, you know, the values that they uh, respected were not ones which I could demonstrate. So I was very, very unsuccessful. There. When I was unsuccessful in my mid-20s to late 20s at the Boston Consulting Group, I made the fatal error of redoubling my efforts and trying very hard. And I ended up working 80 or 90 hours a week. And I was determined that I would not fail at, at, at that particular job. And of course, the more I worked, the worse it became. You know, my relationship suffered, my, my, my friends all never saw me and disappeared. <laughs> and uh, I didn't take exercise and became temporarily, you know, rather chubby in the face. And, and not exactly fat, but nevertheless not athletic, and it was uh, it was pointless. I should have given up, you know. So the idea that hard work is important, you know, is not is not my experience. Ever since then, I've tried to work less. 
uh, but to try and work on things that I, I think I am, um, you know, unusually interested in and uh, which might be quite important. But if you think about it, the idea that hard work generates success is so stupid because there are millions of people, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people in the world who uh, work very hard and never become successful. And, of course, you've got these people who, you know, become billionaires or otherwise very successful in whatever sphere they're operating in. And they always say, well, of course, it's due to the fact that I work very hard. Has it never occurred to them that other people work very hard and never get anywhere? Is this a plausible explanation? No, it's absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. So if you work very hard, stop. Please stop. <laughs> And talking of stopping, Matthew, I've got to stop in about three minutes. I'm so sorry. Uh, but maybe we can have another podcast later. So that was the end of the first part of the interview that we did around about nine months ago. We managed to get Richard back for a second part because we had so many questions to ask him that went unanswered. So please enjoy the second part of the interview with Mr. Richard Kosh. Well, thanks for joining us again, Richard, for, for part two of our interview and um, we're very uh, very pleased to, to have you back on. Um, I'm going to continue where we where we finished off and we, we um, I think you made a statement about telling people um, you know stop working as hard as what you're doing because it's not gonna make you successful and I, I was reading since our last interview I wrote I, I was reading about um, a, a story you told about Bill Bain that just worked four hours a week I believe if I'm or four hours a day I'm not sure which one and I, I just in your mind what, what have you found has been the sort of optimum level of working hours that you know based on your many years of experience that people should think about I can't come up with a number but I do think it's very important not to be stressed because stress is very harmful and I but Bill Bain actually had a, a dictum which was don't let activity drive out thought and he certainly didn't let activity drive out of thought. I don't know how, I, I, I suspect he worked fewer than four hours a day and, and probably slightly more than four hours a week. But, but um, his whole existence was directing other people who were working 80 hours a week or something like that. Uh, but he was doing what we're thinking, or at least he was doing a great deal of thinking. And he was encouraging them to do the thinking but he didn't tell them to stop working either. So, you know, there's a little bit of um, uh, ideology in this and quite a bit of uh, kidding. But, but seriously, you know, if you're working very, very hard, unless you're fantastically enjoying it, it's not to be recommended. Uh, all of the great work that anyone has ever done, I mean, you probably think of yourself and think of other people as well, actually come from a feeling of... Um, being in the zone, fulfillment, joy, whatever you want to call it. It's actually an activity which you would really like to continue. And so, you know, the worst period of my life was when I was working for the Boston Consulting Group uh, in my late uh, 20s, say 1920s, in my late 20s. And uh, I was failing. I wasn't actually very succeeding at that work because I wasn't a brilliant uh, heavy duty analyst or indeed anywhere near it. Uh, but I reckon that if I just redoubled my efforts and worked very hard, uh, I would make it because I'd never done anything in my life that had not been, you know, within reasonable limits successful. And I hear I was failing at this job and it's just awful. Uh, so I thought, well, what do I do? I work harder. Well, I couldn't have done, you know, I, I really couldn't have done a worse thing than, than working harder because it, it, it's, you know, I, I did stop thinking. Uh, I also stopped, you know, uh, being a reasonable human being. My relationship suffered greatly. Uh, I got fat in the face. You know, I'm, I'm quite old now, but I'm still slim. <laughs> but then, I, you know, my face was looked a bit like a hamster. Uh, and um, it was awful. And it didn't do any good at all. And they threw me out <laughs> pretty soon after that. They almost, well, they asked me to resign. So, no uh, so, so, you know, it, it certainly didn't work. And one of the things is if you don't work very much or very many hours, you have to be unbelievably selective about what it is that you're doing. Mm. And uh, that requires a great deal of thought. 
And, you know, I'm a great believer in the 80-20 principle, which says that the vast majority of productive output takes place in a very small proportion of your time. So you need to identify what it is that sort of somehow generates that, you know, that super productive period. And, it, it, you know, if you're in business, it might be doing something like uh, inventing a new product or starting a new business or selling a huge amount of, of business to a large client. Uh, or having a great idea that no one else has had before. If you're in sports, I don't really know what it is, actually. I don't know what you see in sports. It, I think sports is perhaps a little bit different from other things in that, you know, you, you do have to incrementally improve. And so it's, it's, I think it's very unlike most activities. But on the other hand, the important thing is the sport that you decide to specialise in and now, you, the concept that you have and how you actually decide what it is that you're going to do. And is it different from what other people are doing? Or is it just, you know, are you in a race where there are lots of other people doing something very, very similar? You really want to compete, if at all possible, in areas where you're so much better than other people that they just might as well not bother. And I suspect that's rather dif difficult in sport. And you, you, you refer to to this in in the book about purpose and and I was I was sort of reading where you 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 referred to sort of having a lot of interest but struggling to find your purpose um, and I guess it's something that is very important to have that unreasonable success. Have you found that there's been some lessons from your perspective in in trying to kind of find out what that thing is? that we're all probably not aware of that we should put more of our effort into? I think it's, I don't think you can actually sit down with a piece of paper or indeed certainly not on a computer screen and say, well, what is it that I should do? Or you can't even go for a long walk and decide that sort of thing. I think it has to hit you, it has to hit you over the head uh, suddenly. And uh, in order for it to hit you over the head, you have to be listening and you know, the greatest step forward in my career was probably when I found out that two of my colleagues in uh, Bain and Company, who were also junior vice presidents of the company, had decided to go off to Boston to talk to Bill Bain. And I didn't know why they'd gone and what, what was happening. But it suddenly occurred to me that perhaps they had decided to resign. I don't know how I thought that. But it was because their phones were off, I think. And, you know, you never you never left your phone off and you never refused to return calls because it might be an important client. So, um, so I thought it was very mysterious. And I actually cycled round to, I slept on it, and then I cycled round to the home of one of the two people. And he was a guy called Ian Evans, and he lived in Hew near the River Thames, very nice house. And I banged on the door. <laughs> And I, I got no answer at all. And I shouted through the letterbox, Zoe, that was his wife's name, and Ian. And I got no response at all. And then just as I was about to go, Zoe came to the door and said, you better come in. And they told me that they had been to Boston, that they had resigned, that Bill Bain had taken it very badly, that he threatened a lawsuit against them. And they were sort of, you know, absolutely stunned. Um, and I said to them, well, it's funny that you want to set up your own strategy consulting business because that's exactly what I want to do. And how about I join forces with you? And they were at such a low ebb that they thought, well, maybe this is not such a bad idea. Uh, and for various reasons, uh, they, the lawyers said, no, go away. And got a difficult job dealing with Bill Bain with two of us and we don't want three. But very soon afterwards, we did join forces and we started. Now, I had a deep desire to own a consulting group. I had a deep desire to actually start a um, strategy consulting firm. But I didn't know how to do it. And then suddenly it happened, you know, that I was, I was sort of listening, if you like, to the slightest clue as to what it was that uh, I should do. And I think if you've got a very, very strong desire to do something and you keep that in the back of your mind, then you can be aware 
of a possibility of a transformation which you wouldn't otherwise uh, come to. And in my book, Unreasonable Success and How to Achieve It, I discuss how that happened to 20 out of the 20 people in the book in one way or another, that, that they suddenly realized that they had a transforming experience and they were, they were not the people that they were before, or they suddenly realized what it was that they wanted to do and that they could do, that they, they, they saw a path forward. So I think it's really just being open to the clues that, that they're out there. I mean, we, you know, it's all about selective attention. You know, I once asked um, one, of my, uh, one of my nephews how he managed to hear when he was, when his children were very young, when they were in trouble or whatever. And he said, it's all selective attention. <laughs> so most of the time you block out everything that, you know, a two year old or a three year old is saying, because good heavens, you don't want to listen to that. But, but suddenly if they're in danger or if there's something that's really, really important, you, you hear it. And I think it's that kind of selective attention that you, that you need in order to be aware of the few times in life when your whole life can turn on a very small coin, on a sixpence, as we'd say in England, in the days we had sixpences. Uh, so it's it's that it's that combination of extreme desire and openness, because you'll never work out what to do by having, you know, a pen and paper and sort of making a list and say, well, what are the things I'm exceptionally good at doing, and all those conventional things. It won't it won't uh, it won't happen that way. Do you think it that's was. something to do with your, like you, in the book, you've met reference how you get your unconscious mind to work for you. And sometimes whether you go out for a walk or a workout, you set yourself a puzzle and then sometimes this comes to you. Do, do you think some of it is, is that being conscious and saying, okay, you know, here's, here's what I need to solve and, and, and allowing that time for it to happen, do you think? Yes, I think the unconscious mind, I mean, the neuroscientists say that, that 95%, I don't know how they can possibly calculate this, uh, but 95% of uh, the mind is actually unconscious rather than conscious. And you know it, you know, I mean, if, if you're out for a walk and you know the route, well, you're not paying attention to the route. And actually, if you're driving most of the time, you're unconscious as well is driving rather than you're driving, which is sort of quite a sobering thought, really. But ne nevertheless, if you if you're open to the unconscious mind, I mean, one of the things that that has been proven is if you have a difficult problem, the last thing that you should do is try and solve it late at night. Particularly if you're reading your emails and going through it, and you know, oh God, I've got to reply to this email today. I have I've left it for three days or whatever, uh, but it's a difficult problem. Don't you know? Switch the machine off. Listen to some music. Read something. Have a shower do anything but just before you go to sleep think you know think a little bit about this issue and then just switch off or just go to sleep anyway and then you might wake up at three o'clock in the morning and suddenly find you've got the answer or you might wake up hopefully at seven o'clock in the morning and find you've got the answer. it's very inconvenient to have it at three or four o'clock in the morning but you know it will get sorted because the unconscious mind is busy busy, 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 rearranging the patterns of your life and trying to find an answer for you. And if you sleep on it, it's a good old piece of folk wisdom before they even knew what the unconscious mind was, <laughs> uh, then you're likely to, to do that. So use your unconscious mind. Yes, definitely. And, with, uh, with, and use your intuition. Uh, yeah. And also with you, you said earlier about, you know, Bill Bain was like, you know, hard work, forces out hard thinking or something along those lines have you found a activity way activity drives out thought ac yeah. activity drives out thought um have you found a way of of being able to be so, so putting you know not doing it at the end of a day is one point but is there anything in terms of when you need to to do that kind of hard thinking have you have you got some sort of rituals that you do to to or, or to structure to be effective at thinking about some of the things that you want to do because it sounds like it's exercise. An important part. exercise is the thing i mean what you need to do is to do exercise which is not i mean this is not for you know people who are trying to you know run a three minute mile or something like that but this this is exercise for people who take exercise not too seriously so cycling or walking 
are the way that I do it. And uh, you, you've got to do a route which you're familiar with, so the unconscious mind can sort of ju just take over. And you don't think about anything. And other people do it through meditation. I've never been able to meditate myself. Uh, I've tried to follow all the instructions. It's too, all too complicated for me. Uh, but in a way, I sort of meditate when I'm when I'm riding my bicycle or when I'm walking uh, the dog. And suddenly a thought will, will hit you. It won't hit you unless you really care about the subject. You've got to be very selective about what you're uh, bothered about. But if you're really selective about that, then you'll find the answer. And the answer will come easily. Uh, you, you don't have to work hard to get the answer. Hmm. Uh, I found out myself, actually, if I'm running, it just whenever I start running 10 minutes in and then I'm like on my phone, like uh, this idea, that idea. It's, I, it, it's amazing how um, a lot of the problems get solved when I'm going out for a run. <laughs> as long as you keep the phone switched off so that you can use it as an aid memoir. Uh, I, I wait until I get home. I never, I never, I'm very strange. I, I, I do have an iPhone, but. I never take it with me. It's not a mobile phone. It just stays on my desk. Right. Uh, but yes. So, so one of the other points, Richard, is unrealistic expectations. This is one that I've been toying with myself because I know that you're in a business where the expectations for you was extremely high and for other people, and it seemed to kind of bring out the best in in you. And I, I could see that in me at certain times. You know, if someone's got very high standards, you tend to rise to them. But I'm just wondering if there's a a flip side of that where you could potentially sort of burn people out um un, un, you know un, unwillingly unwantingly um and you know have, have you sort of had any lessons in terms of you know how to get that balance in setting those unrealistic expectations well it's definitely true i mean one of the things that really shocked me was when one of my consultants when we were running lek my consultancy firm came to me and said that you're destroying people's lives, Richard. Do you realise that? <laughs> I said, what? Uh, and, and it was this thing that you're talking about, I see, you know, sort of burning, burning people out. And the, the truth is that some people can take it and others can't. And I, I do think that if you want to have unreasonable success, in other words, if you want to be yeah, someone who achieves something that other people haven't been able to do uh, in whatever field it is, whether it's business or sport or any any endeavor, uh, or if it's, uh, you know, trying to work out how people should live their lives, you've got to be unreasonably demanding. And um, some people can take that and, and thrive on it and enjoy it, and other people can't. And so I have a slightly harsh Darwinian sort of view about <laughs> achievement. Achievement is not necessarily the most important thing in life at all. You know, unless you've, unless you've got this sort of, you know, uh, somewhat neurotic desire to achieve things, which I'm all in favor of. I think ambition is one of the great things to have. Uh, but unless you've got unreasonable expectations, you're not going to be unreasonably successful. And, you know, I, I think part of the part of the uh, issue in life is whether you want to be in that kind of um, race. <laughs> most people don't, and most people probably shouldn't. But if you've got that desire, you've got to satisfy it because you won't you won't be happy otherwise, and you won't find joy except through work. I mean, I think that you know the people I know who are really really happy are almost always people who enjoy their work, whatever it is, but vocation, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be paid work at all. It could be bringing up children. It could be, um, you know, running a home for uh, damaged people of one sort or another. It could be, uh, it could be writing poetry. It could be anything. But, but if you, if you haven't got that desire, you can't simulate it. You know, you can't say, well, I've got this, I've read this book called Unreasonable Success and how to achieve it. And so I ought to try and be unreasonably successful. No, 
Now, only if you really, 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 really want to do it should you. You do have it. to develop a culture of of people, though. Like, if you're starting a company or you're leading, like like you was, do you, do you, are you having to sort of almost like hire for that to say, look, you're you're entering a company that wants to be unreasonably successful. Yeah, yeah. You know, come on the bus if you want to be part of that. If not, it's probably not going to work for you is that is that part of the that's exactly process? right yeah and I, I i wish i'd said that to people at the, at the beginning <laughs> i mean this guy who who actually you know felt burnt up and rest he was one of 30 people that i hired after the company had been going for two years and we went to oxford and cambridge university and we wanted to hire people who were cheap <laughs> therefore young and inexperienced but who had got very high energy and that's the way that i put it and one of the things that i did require was that they demonstrated one way or another that they were very high energy. So sport was very, very important, but it wasn't the only way. They could be, you know, unbelievably dedicated to music or they could be, you know, great to basses or they could be anything. But, but nevertheless, people who were high energy, who would, you know, the people who absolutely wanted to do things and wanted to, you know, the difference between an extrovert and an introvert is very interesting because an introvert is someone who uh, actually can perform. They can give presentations. They can, you know, do podcasts if you like. But it's hard. It takes energy out. And there are other people who feel at the end of a, you know, an interview or a podcast or whatever it is that they're doing they feel energized you know they actually feel not drained but they feel you know as though it it, it was negative energy required to do something like that because that's what they like doing and so you know if you if you want to be unreasonably successful it's probably better to be not necessarily an extrovert but 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 in the field that you've chosen it's got to be easy in a way it's got when it's very hard it's easy because it's a challenge and you like it. And, um, you know, you're always thinking about how you could do something that no one else had done. And it's sort of, you know, it's, it's an ego trip perhaps, but it's not effortful. Mm. You know, if it's effortful, you shouldn't be doing it. It's my view. That's a good because indicator. Because there are lots of things you can do. <laughs> if, if, lots of things you can do in life, which are not effortful and enjoyable and which don't cause you angst and worry and, and things like that. But if what you're doing does cause you angst and worry, you're doing the wrong, you're absolutely doing the wrong thing. Mm. You know, you should be doing something that you are ideally suited to do and that you're so much better at than anybody else that it's not difficult and the competition is irrelevant. Um, now, finding that may take a lifetime, but in, unless unless you actually really want to do it, you shouldn't do it. Uh, and you'll know, because if you're, if you're uh, trying to push water uphill, then you'll fail. Like I was at Boston Consulting Group, you know, and that analysis was not what I was supposed to be doing. So how do you uh, balance that with- And the sooner the you find out what it is that you don't want to do or can't do, the sooner you'll find what it is that you do want to do. So how how do you balance that then with um with when you're when you're budgeting you're setting unrealistic expectations for budgeting because I was reading where you said that I can't I can't remember the exact details but you you were going to grow by a hundred percent for a period of time it was it was unreasonable growth that you had set out to do which most people would have thought well you know if if you sat down with my finance director it's like look it's great that you're setting that but i want a budget that you're going to be able to hit so how do you balance the the sort of unrealistic expectations in terms of right our company's going to grow 100 percent for the next so many years but also try, trying to do something that is at the same time realistic or do you just say look we're going to do it and we're going to figure out what realistic is how, how do you balance that those two elements yeah budgeting's a problem um we never budgeted in uh, LEK. We never had a budget. And I, I remember saying to my partners, you know, B, BCG, we knew, grew at about 20% a year. Bain and Company, quite outrageously, said they'd grow at 40% a year. And this was in revenues, in headcount, and in profits. And I said, well, why don't we go for 100%? And everyone said to me, yeah, 100%. Well, I said, the way to do that is to hire people 
because if you've got the cost, you've got to get the revenue. That was that was the you know very primitive view we had. We never had a budget, ever, never ever had a budget. But we said, yeah, it'd be kind of good to do that. Well, how do you know whether you're going to double in size or double in revenue? It's quite easy, actually. You know, if your revenue was X, you, <laughs> next year you had to do two X, and then you try and work out how you could possibly do that. And again, Bill Bain had this great saying that your best new customer is your existing customer. So he he would look at how to increase the budget within the budget again, but the consulting revenue really within a particular client. And the way to do that was to do incredibly valuable work. So if you did incredibly valuable work, they want more of it. Was sort of the very simplistic view. Uh, and so you know, therefore. That's that's what you do. But the problem comes, Matthew. The problem comes when you have external shareholders, and then you get into the bind that every chief executive, every CFO, every managing director, every um, uh, finance director, you know, gets to, which is they play a game. They play a game, and it's a horrid, horrid game for everyone. Which is that they they know that. They think that they might be able to do a hundred, and then they put eighty in the budget. Uh, and the reason that they do that is that it's much better to to fulfil to you know to basically outperform expectations than it is to underperform expectations. So the, the setting expectations is the key thing. But if you set expectations below what you think that you can do. You're more likely not to do it, and if you say, again, it comes back to unreasonable expectation. If you, if you say, "Well, actually, we're going to do the impossible," well, you might get quite close to it. But if you say, uh, "We're actually going to do reasonably well," you're limiting yourself. You're putting a ceiling on what it is that you can do, and there's nothing more stupid in the world on, than that. Because actually, in your heart of hearts, you really feel that you could do better. But unfortunately, you get into this game where saying, "Well, we have these horrible people called shareholders, and we better tell them that we're not going to do as well as we hope to do." Uh, and then you don't do as well. As you, <laughs> you see what I mean? It's a vicious yeah. circle. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you're actually only reporting to yourself, and this is why you know I, 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 you know, it was so liberating for me to be part of the partnership because the only people I had to satisfy were were my partners and myself, and you know the partners were a bit of a problem. I probably preferred not to have any partners from that point of view, but I couldn't do the things that they could do. So it was that was fine. Um, it's very important not to play that game. And I don't know quite how you manage that uh, if you have external shareholders. Far, I, I actually think it's far better if you can possibly... I'm arguing against myself because my life now is mainly... I write books, but I'm also an investor. So I invest in these venture capital companies and I try and, you know, have a relationship with the chief executive so they'll tell me what they're really thinking rather than, you know, what they think I might know, you know, would put up with uh, and view as being satisfactory. Uh, I'm trying to get them to to think about their dreams and how, you know, they can conquer the world. I don't I don't want to know what the next budget's going to be at all. And that's the, that's the that's what you've got to do. You've got to make people as ambitious as they can possibly be themselves, or more so. And budgeting, I think maybe budgeting is a big mistake. Maybe we shouldn't have budgets at all. Yeah, I like that one. I like that one. So in terms of, like, you've obviously lived this, and you, you clearly do. Both books, um, I, in my mind, kind of weave together quite nicely. But have, have you found any sort of daily habits that you've developed over the years that have helped you to have your unreasonable success whether that is something as simple as just walking and working out and thinking or any other things that that you think are worth sharing that, that you know we could learn from well it's quite it's quite difficult to generalize but but one of the things that I've always wanted to do ever since I, well, ever since I was conscious of anything really, um, ever since I was a teenager, is I've wanted to be in the sunshine. <laughs> and if you if you grow up in Britain, that's, <laughs> that's difficult, uh, particularly if you want to be in warm sunshine. And so, you know, the liberating experience for me was to go hitchhiking around Europe, and so, particularly Southern Europe, 
when I was 17. I did that for three and a half months. And I discovered that it was nicer there than it was in the UK. And so I sort of, you know, have made a point whenever I can to sit in the sunshine. Uh, all of my good ideas, if they're not generated by the unconscious mind, come from sitting in the sunshine and reading. Or maybe I'll be writing a draft of a book rather than writing it on the computer. Um, but uh, to generalize, because not everyone thinks sunshine is important as I do, although I, I think many people do really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it's also, where are you living now, Matthew? <laughs> California. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Um, you know, maybe it's it's not sunshine for some people. It's it's doing what you enjoy, uh, but but also that we might possibly have a good result professionally. Uh, so that's really, you know, all of it comes from enjoyment, but in one form or another, all inspiration, all creativity comes from some form of enjoyment, mental enjoyment. So my last no, question no, then, Richard, because yeah. I know you, I know you've got to go. I've but if, go. You, if if you had to apply the eighty twenty principle to your book, what would be the twenty percent that you think that you should focus on? Which book on the unreasonable success? Unreasonable or success, or... yeah, unreasonable success. I think it's the chapter on transforming experience. Just to recap, if people haven't read the book, what, what a transforming experience is you go into something as one person and you come out as someone who's 10 times more effective or infinitely more effective or creative or whatever. So, you know, I mean, my transforming experiences were working in BCG and Bain and & Company and, and actually starting LEK as well, co-starting LEK. But you've got a you know, if you haven't had a, if you've had a transforming experience in life, that's great. But most people haven't. And every single person in the book who was very successful and had a transforming experience, they, they were different as a result. Sometimes it was a very unpleasant experience. Uh, and, uh, you know, for Margaret Thatcher, it was the Falklands, you know, where she thought that the whole world was falling apart and she could have been thrown out of office, quite likely. Um, for Viktor Frankl, who wrote one of the best books, Man's Search for Meaning, that I've ever read. You know, it was being in a con putting in a, con a concentration camp, or actually a series of concentration camps by Adolf Hitler. Uh, so, you know, it's something that really makes you. And if you haven't had a kind of transforming experience, I've described in the book ways in which you might engineer or be, be open to something that might be a transforming experience. Because you can't do it on your own, Matthew, you, you know, you can be a wonderfully, wonderfully, wonderfully productive person, unreasonably successful and all the rest of it. But something's got to hit you over the head at some stage. And if you haven't been hit over the head, well, you better find a way of being hit over the head <laughs> and having this experience, which makes you different. Fantastic. Okay, we well, Richard, thank that. you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.